I will try to present very quickly a, a, a lot of different ideas that might be quite um, uh, counterintuitive to most of what the you know, service design discourse is all about. Most of the times people talk about how we can capitalize <laughs> or how we can extend uh, service design to different boundaries of the world. And I'm talking about something else, which is becoming more attuned to uh, the people that are usually excluded from this process of capitalizing, expanding, and also, um, yeah, so to speak, colonization. I mean, have to, let, let's see what does service design has to do with colonization. But before we go to that, we need to um, understand what decolonizing means. Generally, decolonizing means uh, that we are trying to um, come with terms with the colonial legacy. For example, a lot of uh, black people have been enslaved in Africa for 400, 500 years ago, and they were brought forcefully to work as enslaved in America. And since they were there already, they were trying to survive and overcome that terrible situation. Um, they still try to make the best out of it and, and to find and transform America into the new world, to the new place. And so right now uh, we can uh, perceive that the samba the music style from Brazil and the civil rights movements in the US as uh, very important expressions of transforming this colonial legacy into something uh, that is liberating, that's not just good for the um, uh, for the former slave traders, the former slave owners, but in fact, it's actually good for society in general. So the, uh, slavery was not only abolished, but the idea of uh, the racist idea that black people are inferior is being challenged by this decolonizing process. There are many different ways of uh, framing uh, colonization, but one of the most important things that is uh, relevant to the service design is is called uh, cultural invasion. So by implementing different cultural values in a different culture and overlapping that and replacing the original culture, colonization extends its power, not just through political uh, aspects, but also through cultural values that are considered to be superior to the, the original values of the culture in place where the colonizers came in. And this has been described by many authors I'm here drawing on the work of Paulo Freire. Paulo Freire and other philosophers, they challenged this um, ancient Greek uh, philosophy where uh, this concept of ontology, of uh, uh, metaphysics, uh, stay above everything else and it's superior to any kind of uh, knowledge that people can have in their everyday lives. This has been standardized and established by Greek philosophers like Plato, like Aristotle, uh, but um, Europeans, they still um, nowadays refer back to this Greek uh, ancient culture as if they were like uh, continuing that tradition up to these days. And that's the reason why if you go to the global south, you will find the Greek uh, philosophy and also Greek aesthetics being re reproduced every now and then, here and there, and especially in uh, commercial service, especially in, in companies, especially that, that offer like uh, retail services, but also any kind of services that seems to be of a, coming from a high culture. So Greek aesthetics and ethics is a kind of a reference for this colonized mindset. And it's not a coincidence that why Greek uh, aesthetics and ethics is ref referenced is because originally Greek culture and Greek politics relied a lot on slave economy. I mean, all the um, the the major work was conducted by enslaved people. Uh, they were not like black Africans at those times, but they were mostly people who were captured doing wars or who became uh, who inherited too much debt that they could not pay. So they became slaves to pay their debt. And aesthetics and ethics, uh, they uh, worked to, to legitimize so people would accept this inferiority. And theater was essential to that. Theater was a kind of a narrative that explained why some people that have some inferiority should uh, should um, pay, should uh, suffer, should work harder than others, and especially women. Women in Greece, they didn't have a, a place in a democratic society like we do have for women right now in most uh, modern countries. 
Uh, women, for example, they could not even act in, in theaters. They, if they, there was a, a female character in the play, men would use um, female masks, like what you see here in the top corner, most right of this, this picture, you see a Greek mask for a woman. And you can already see that it's not as potent, not, not as powerful as the other masks for usual for male characters. And what does this design history has to do with contemporary service design? Well, service design is heavily shaped after European ancient Greek canons. Let's see how this is still being played out. Well, emojis, they are kind of modern masks and men still use uh, female masks to convey what they think about the prejudice of women, what they think of women, women are thinking. And therefore this sexist uh, prejudice is being reproduced in society through aesthetics. That service design sometimes are critically reproduces while using an emoji set. This is an old fashioned uh, emoji set that has been already fixed uh, after so much criticism. But anyhow, we still have this kind of uh, standard uniforms for women that are different from the men, usually letting uh, the female body be more exposed as a kind of a product, as a kind of uh, interface that represents nicety and care, whereas men stay in these more stiff uniforms and representing strength and a more technical approach to work. And this is still ongoing in service designers are sometimes responsible for designing un these uniforms. And uh, not only that, but also gestures and speech, uh, way, uh, the tone of voice, all of these things that sometimes reinforces gender biases. And this is uh, sometimes uh, covered up. If it, it can get even worse than just in the front stage uh, because service design has this inherited from theater, this division between front stage and backstage that comes all the way back to from Greece. They, they invented this division between front space and backspa backstage. And it was the mean to uh, create this magical appearance of theater where things would happen in the front stage and uh, the audience would not know what was going on because in fact, they were manipulated to accept a society where these hierarchies, where this inequality was considered to be normal and even um, justified by the gods. And nowadays, we see this happening uh, again, still because of this influence of theater metaphor in, in service design, that we try to hide what's going on in the backstage and we, we design interfaces that make it opaque or difficult to see through uh, the, the, the user interface. So you do not see which kind of people are affected by your choices and which kind of uh, uh, people are working in under, in under precarious conditions and therefore being exploited in an unfair way. For example, like happens to many delivery services, digital delivery systems. How can we then decolonize service design? Um, I speak from an experience of working in Brazil for almost 10 years in this field, teaching there and doing research, I also work with clients. And how can we get rid of this ancient Greek influence? Well, in Brazil, we had these two major, interesting, very inspiring works. The Pedagogy of the Press, were written by Paulo Freire, who I already mentioned, but also a different way of doing theater, which is pretty much consistent and coherent with this philosophical view over education, which is Theater of the Press by Augusto Boal. I've been trying and experimenting using Theater of the Press as an, an inspiration approach for discussing and putting to the public the service design features that are currently debated in newspapers or in, in internet forums. For example, uh, the urban call for silence ride feature have been, um, uh, have been rolled out in Brazil some years ago. So we played a theater of the press, uh, a, a scene where there was a, a person feeling being uh, controlled, the driver was feeling being shut down, down by this, shut up by this uh, specific feature. And that was not a nice way of relating people uh, within that um, uh, interaction. Uh, we also experimented using theater of the press as a means to replace body storming. So this will be a form of critical body storming where st design studios could envision uh, liberating or anti-oppressive interactions in new services like Pombocop, which is a, a system for um, uh, identifying and punishing people that commit uh, transphobic and homophobic actions in uh, public uh, streets. Finally, I, I would like to propose that theater of the press is not just a practice that can be applied um, literally, but we can also apply it metaphorically. And there are a lot of interesting concepts that you can later on check it out on the references that I'll provide. 
But in a nutshell, theater of the press does not rely on this division between backstage and front stage, which is the characteristic of theater of the press, the Greek theater that we inherit in service design. So if we want to become more anti-oppressive, we need to draw other metaphors like this one where in the aesthetic space, Everybody who's involved, who's affected by a service, including clients and service providers and designers, they can move in and back and they can play out their activities in a different way. They can reimagine themselves working together and that can go back and forth all the time so that we have a constant redesign atmosphere or a strategy. That's what theater of the press led us to. Um, I, I'm showing not uh, design, service design projects that implemented literally theater of the press, but now I'm showing those that implemented metaphorically this metaphor of all of people involved collaborating, co-design service has been uh, implemented by uh, Rafaela Elotre, a former student of mine uh, who worked uh, um, with co women coffee workers in the whole production chain, connecting women in the rural area with women in the, in the urban area and letting them collaborate so that they could strengthen their bonds and fight sexism in the production chain together. And another example, very different from this, that one, uh, the culture produces designing ways of uh, um, producing and, and, and conserving traditional popular cultures that sometimes don't receive funding in cultural heritage programs. And these culture producers, they devise the way of creating some kind of a, solidarity economy circuit for every of these communities so that people will not rely on volunteer work but actually on paid work using social currency digital currency that we actually provided using this digital platform uh, that had some kind of a service uh, interaction um, mechanism so that they could uh, uh, leave without having regular um, economic money like the traditional money so finally, my final words uh, that is that to decolonize service design, we need service design of the oppressed, meaning that oppressed are actually designing the service and, and they are designing for themselves. So they are the ultimately the ones who are gonna uh, profit the most. And that means that designers, if they wanted to join uh, the oppressed and recognize themselves as being oppressed, they need to find some kind of identity with the oppressed either for, because they are of the same gender, of the same race, or they have been racialized in the same way, or they are in the same class, or they have an analogy. So for example, they are oppressed in one relation and they see that the people uh, on the backstage or the front stage, they are oppressed in a similar way. Well, I try to be as quick as possible, but you can go deep into this topic if you follow up these references and you can search for them on my website.